Hello, this is Ellen Foley, and this is Business 120. Today, we're going to talk about Chapter 2 of our book, Business Ethics. It turns out that ethics goes back a long, long time, 1780 B.C., to a king named Hammurabi, who issued this lofty statement that became rule of law. I'll give you a minute so that you can read it. Our jobs as scholars and employees, future employers, and good citizens is to learn how to apply ethical decision-making in an imperfect world. There's a difference between morality and ethics. Morality refers to a person's or group's standards. Ethics refers to the study and assessment of those standards. What is business ethics? It's the standards of business behaviors that promote human welfare and common good. It asks the question, what should I do and why? Ethical issues include fairness and honesty, organizational relationships, conflict of interest, deceiving communications, Real-life business ethics issues can involve these many aspects of business life. They include bribery, discrimination, corporate social responsibility, and corporate fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility. Let's look at what business ethics looks like. It looks like how we act as individuals in business. It shows us how our business organizations are structured, structured, excuse me, and how they work. It also shows us how we structure our business, our society, and our culture, and our laws. There are many benefits to business ethics, and they may surprise you. A good track record of ethics attracts customers, boosts sales, keeps great employees, attracts great employees, and impresses investors. There are also risks and costs of unethical behavior. You can damage your brand, decrease productivity, increase turnover, and very dangerously, you can increase your customer's dissatisfaction with you. Inside the organization, you can increase misconduct and internal conflict. And on a broader scale, you can ruin people's lives and their reputations. The costs of unethical employee behavior are varied. There's time theft, dishonesty, theft of actual 3D items, waste, data integrity issues, and conflict of interest. I worked at a company where a fellow employee during his boring times, bored times, I guess, during the day, would page through the um, human resources files of fellow employees. These contained family issues, personnel decisions, misbehavior on the job, many things that HR as a science tries to keep private. Well, when they found out what he was doing, they dismissed him. This fellow wasn't in HR. 
He was in IT and he was using his skills in information technology to spy on his fellow employees. The government has tried to control unethical behavior and one of its efforts was the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. There's some question about whether the act is strong enough given the 2008 global crisis that we'll discuss in a few moments. Sarbanes-Oxley came after a very famous business scandal called the Enron Trader Scandal. Jobs, health care, and pensions were lost. The act tried to put forward rules that would protect citizens from accounting behaviors that were unethical. Many companies now have codes of conduct, and three of the best are on page 43 of your book, and I encourage you to review them as you're reading. One of these companies, Starbucks, was tested on whether it stuck by its ethical behavior. Two black men were arrested for trespassing in one of the Starbucks stores or coffee houses in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This caused an uproar. Enron, excuse me, Enron, Starbucks spent millions of dollars, closed stores, and put many, many people through racial bias training. As I said earlier, the 2008 global financial crisis also involved questionable ethical behavior. You may have heard the phrase, too big to fail. During this ethical time, or unethical time, the banks took actions that hurt their customers and made many of them go broke and thought they were going to make a bundle by doing this rather unattractive and illegal behavior. It didn't work out for them though. A financial industry that bet against the banks almost put them all out of business and taxpayers through our federal government had to bail them out. William Dudley in 2013 suggested that the deep-seated cultural and ethical failures at many large financial institutions contributed to the growing size and complexity of banking structures and led to bad incentives. Scholars and executives continue to examine these codes, especially since the Black Lives Matters movement started in earnest this year. It's true that 90% of all Fortune 500 companies have codes of conduct. However, the big question is, are they meaningful? Think about it. We'll be having some discussions in class, and please check Blackboard for your assignments. Thanks, and I'll see you soon.